Hello, I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's streaming, streaming only History is Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackelford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're working safely with the skeleton crew from our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium, here in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. This Sunday, May the 2nd, at 1 p.m., the Eudora Welty House and Garden will have a plant swap and program with horticulturist Felder Rushing. Find details on the Welty House Facebook page for that and join us then. And I hope that you'll join us next week for History's Lunch when Jennifer Bond will discuss her book, Buildings of Mississippi. For the first time in more than a year, I can invite you to either watch the live stream or come here to the museums and join us in person. We'll be masked and socially distanced, and we'll have drinks but no food this first month. And I look forward to seeing your bright and shining faces next Wednesday. Today, we are delighted to have Claire Whitlinger, author of the University of North Carolina Press book, Between Remembrance and Repair, Commemorating Racial Violence in Philadelphia, Mississippi. Claire Whitlinger is Assistant Professor of Sociology at Furman University. She earned her BA in Sociology from George Washington University and her MA and PhD in Sociology from the University of Michigan. Whitlinger is the creator and co-founder of Furman's Intergroup Dialogue Program and the 2019 recipient of Furman University's Meritorious Diversity and Inclusion Award for Faculty. Her research has been featured in Sociological Forum, Mobilization, and most recently, PBS's American Experience. Claire will join us today via Zoom from Greenville, South Carolina. Please ask any questions you may have for her in the comments of this video, and we'll put those to her at the appropriate time. Now, welcome Claire Whitlinger. Hello, um, thank you so much for having me. Um, I just, yeah, I'm so grateful for the invitation. And I thought before we get started with the presentation that it might be helpful for me to say a little bit about my disciplinary perspective. So I know that in this series, you hear a lot from historians um, and that's wonderful. And they are some of my absolute favorite people. Um, and I'm a sociologist, um, but I'm a historical sociologist, right? So. What does that actually mean? Well, in my field, um, we, we use a lot of different types of methodologies to answer a diverse set of questions about the social world. Um, we use statistics to do large scale um, you know, quantitative analysis. We use interviews and ethnography to get a sense of meaning making. Um, and we also use historical methods, um, which is usually a combination of archival work, um, as well as interviews, especially when you're doing recent history like I do, um, because I learned actually the hard way that some of what I was hoping to find in the archives isn't there yet, right? Um, <laughs> um, and there are some things that just won't be archived given the nature of the subject and the people who were a part of the projects. So as a historical sociologist, I'm interested in particulars. I'm interested in change over time and the sequence of events as they unfold. But as a sociologist, I'm oriented towards general abstract explanations about broad sociological social phenomenon. Um, and so today, what you'll hear about in this book is in one ways a very particular story. Um, about a place that some of you may be very familiar with. Um, but it's also a very uh, universal story too. Um, and so this is a story about Philadelphia, Mississippi and Neshoba County, but it's also a story about commemorating racial violence and in particular the perils and possibilities of doing so. All right, um, so why don't I go ahead and get started by sharing my screen and um, I'll move through the presentation and I welcome your questions uh, at, at the end. Okay, just getting started, all righty. Okay, so I want to begin um, with some orienting concepts. All right, it's gonna take me just a second to get this going, there we go. Um, the politics of the past, the politics of apology, the politics of regret, reconciliation politics, 
restitution politics. So these are all different ways of describing fundamentally the same thing, right? A relatively new understanding of the relationship between politics, morality, and the past. One that associates public acknowledgement and atonement with moral righteousness and legitimate political action. And this cultural transformation, because this has changed over time, was precipitated by World War II and accelerated by post-Cold War political transitions, has also sparked an intense debate that can be summed up as the following, to remember or forget. So while advocates of commemorating difficult pasts argue that collective remembrance prevents future violence, restores dignity to survivors, establishes the foundation for reconciliation and restores trust in civic institutions following periods of sustained violence and oppression, proponents of forgetting suggest that commemorating difficult pasts encourages rancor and revenge, prioritizes justice over peace, fosters in-group loyalties to the detriment of intergroup relations, and impedes civic and national identity formation. And while these philosophical debates are most certainly important, we, and this is a, a global we, we, we don't know a lot about what commemorations and other acts of remembrance do in the communities where they take place. And this is an empirical question that social scientific methods are particularly well suited to address. And sociologists and other scholars of collective memory have actually written a lot in recent years about commemorations of difficult pasts, but this research has focused overwhelmingly on the causes and compositions of commemorative work. I'm interested in the consequences of that commemorative work, and in particular, whether, how, and under what circumstances commemorations facilitate social change. And this was the question that I had in mind when I first visited Mississippi in 2009. I traveled to the state to investigate local efforts to establish a South African style truth and reconciliation commission. And yet it seemed that everywhere I went, people were talking about Philadelphia, Mississippi. It seemed that something had happened in 2004 that had transformed memory practices in the city and its surrounding county, and perhaps even the state. So in the spirit of, of discovery, I followed these leads and soon recognized that the small community in East Central Mississippi had an incredibly rich history and one that could shed light on the perils and possibilities of commemorating racial violence. So let me briefly introduce the historical case, one that I imagine a lot of you are already familiar with. In fact, the 1964 murders of civil rights activists, Andrew Goodman, James Cheney, and Michael Schwerner outside of Philadelphia, Mississippi, and Neshoba County has been described as the most depressingly familiar story of the civil rights movement, having been recounted in numerous books and immortalized in the 1988 Oscar-winning film, Mississippi Burning. It was the first day of freedom summer a massive civil rights campaign that brought hundreds of college students from predominantly white Northern universities to Mississippi to run freedom schools and register black, local black Mississippians to vote. James Cheney, Michael Schwerner, and Andrew Goodman had decided to leave the freedom summer training in Oxford, Ohio, and head south sooner than expected. See, Mount, Mount Zion, a black church in Neshoba County, had been firebombed, and several of their church members badly beaten, presumably for daring to host a freedom school. And so after visiting Mount Zion, the three young men were arrested on trumped up speeding charges, held in a local jail and released after nightfall. It was the last time they were seen alive. As FBI officials and National Guardsmen searched for the missing civil rights workers, Philadelphia would earn the reputation, the national reputation, as a strange, tight little town for its citizens' silence, denial and obstruction of justice in the case. And 44 days later, and thanks to a local informant, the bodies of the three civil rights workers were discovered in a nearby earthen dam, putting to rest local conspiracy theories that the young man, the young men were simply hiding up north. Three years later in 1967, a federal conspiracy trial would document in excruciating detail what many Neshoba Countyans already knew how 18 Klansmen, including local law enforcement officers, had conspired to kill Cheney Schorner and Goodman. Seven were ultimately convicted in the federal trial, although none would serve more than six years for the crime. Uh, and seven, I'm sorry, not seven, several would return to Neshoba County um, to lead relatively normal lives. And what happened locally in the years and decades 
after the 1967 trial, when the murders became memory, has been less clear. And this is the primary focus of my book. In particular, I set out to understand when and how have the murders been commemorated locally, whether the 2004 commemoration was in fact transformative, and if so, why did the 2004 commemoration spark subsequent memory activism when previous commemorations had failed to do so? And I will touch on all of these questions, but given the time constraints today, my talk will focus on the first and third question. So I just wanted to let you know that up front. Uh, and also, um, before we really dig in, a quick note on methodology. So as a comparative historical sociologist, I began in the archives. And as I said before, I quickly learned that the archives would have limited utility for my interest in more recent history. So in addition to working with archival collections, I collected non-archive documents whenever possible. And this included everything from emails that people would share with me to diaries and meeting notes. And I'm really grateful for people's generosity in helping me understand, understand this case. I also conducted 62 interviews with key informants and spent 13 months in the state conducting participant observation, including six months living in Union, Mississippi, just outside Neshoba County. So let's begin with the first question. When and how have the murders been commemorated locally? You see, there's a traditional historical narrative of Neshoba County's commemorative practices that has circulated colloquially and has also been supported by scholarly literature. And this describes the years between 1964 and 1989 as the quote, long silence, where local residents largely participated in a conspiracy of silence, which is to say that while the identities of those responsible for the 1964 killings were generally known, they were not discussed or acknowledged in public or in any official capacity. And also, according to this narrative, the 25th anniversary commemoration in 1989 shattered this public silence temporarily, after which the community returned to its pre-1989 status quo. Then, 15 years later, the 40th anniversary commemoration in 2004 again punctured this dominant silence, this time it appeared for good. Right? And this traditional narrative is evident in a quotation from Ann Pollan, a waitress from Peggy's restaurant in downtown Philadelphia. And she said, and this is quoted in Howard Ball's uh, book, Murder in Mississippi. She said, for 30 years, no one spoke of the murders. And then in eight, 1989, boom, everybody began talking about what happened a quarter of a century ago. It was as if everyone in Philadelphia and its environs had come out of a collective coma. But this is only part of the story. Neshoba County's Black residents and their allies refused to be silent in 1964 and have commemorated the murders and called for justice ever since. We can see this in 1964 when just weeks after Klansmen burned down Mount Zion, parishioners gathered among the ruins, along with Bob Moses and Ben Cheney, who's the young boy sitting on the platform, to honor the lives and loss of James Cheney, Michael Schwerner, and Andrew Goodman. We can see this one year later on the first anniversary of the murders when some 200 mostly local black residents marched some 10 miles from Philadelphia's independence quarters to Mount Zion, all the while being observed by Deputy Sheriff Price, one of those implicated in the killings. We can see this on the second anniversary of the murders when marchers led by Mar Martin Luther King Jr. came under attack as they attempted a similar procession from independence quarters to Mount Zion, facing a hostile crowd unrestrained by law enforcement. And King would later describe this as one of the most frightening days of his life. And while the news coverage of these annual commemorative events waned in subsequent years, uh, local black churches have marked the anniversary of the murders year after year, hosting annual commemorative rituals and erecting private monuments such as the one you see here at Mount Nebo. So to answer the first question, when and how were the murders commemorated locally? they were commemorated all along, right? Black Neshoba Countyans have never been silent on the murders. On the contrary, right, the county's long history of commemoration has been overlooked by journalists and historians who have conflated the county's history with the history of its white citizens. Sociologically, the longstanding commemorative activity of Neshoba County's black residents served a critical social function. They safeguarded the memory of the 1964 murders and provided the foundation for legal redress four decades later when there were more favorable social and political conditions. And this leads me to my first major theoretical argument about commemorations. The commemorations are path dependent, 
creating conditions of possibility for future commemorations, even when, or especially when, those commemorations are not recognized in the dominant public sphere. And considering this revised historical narrative, which recognizes, as you'll see um, on, on the slide, two parallel communities of memory with distinct trajectories, also requires that the 25th and 40th anniversary commemorations be conceptualized differently. So rather than representing the commemorations, they need to be understood, understood as instances where long suppressed counter memory became however temporarily collective memory, what I refer to as silence breaking commemorations. And these silence breaking commemorations, which we see pictured here also represent an interesting point of comparison. Right? In many ways, these two commemorative events were remarkably similar as large scale community wide commemorations organized by interracial coalitions of local citizens that engaged a wide range of actors, including the victims families and high level uh, high level state politicians. And in many ways, they were precipitated by similar factors, a combination of external pressure from national interest in the murders and also a local concern with both justice and reputational management. Despite these similarities, my research reveals that these events provoked very different outcomes, right? So the 1989 event did little to transform local memory practices, which returned to their pre-1989 status quo immediately following the event. And despite the fact that the 1989 organizers, as the archival documents reveal, really believed that the 25th anniversary commemoration would be a turning point. The 2004 commemoration, on the other hand, did precipitate further sustained memory activism at both the local and state level. And I wanna be clear what I mean by sustained activism. I'm referring to continued efforts to transform local memory practices after the commemorative event took place. I also wanna be clear that a lot of the people that I'm referencing in my talk would not think of themselves as memory activists, right? But when I talk about memory activism, I'm, I'm talking about I'm talking about organized efforts to either change or resist change to the way the past is being remembered. Um, and I would suggest that these folks are very much memory activists, even if they wouldn't think of themselves that way. So following the 2004 commemoration, the planning task force in 2004, later known as the Philadelphia Coalition, continued to meet and advocate for social change albeit supported by a key actor in the nonprofit sector within the state, the William Winter Institute for Racial Reconciliation. And this led to notable racially rooted transformations in Mississippi's legal, educational, and civil spheres. The 2005 prosecution and conviction of Edgar A. Killen for his role as the mastermind behind the 1964 killings. The 2006 passage of an education bill mandating civil and human rights education at every grade level in the state, and I should add, to this day, it's still the only bill um, of its kind, although a, a couple states are beginning to consider passing similar legislation. And then finally, between 2005 and 2009, the Mississippi Truth Project, which as I referenced before, was initially designed to model the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission and later transitioned into a statewide oral history project. And each of these cases, um, which I argue represents significant structural and cultural transformations in the context of Mississippi's history, can be traced back to the 40th anniversary in Philadelphia, Mississippi, which mobilized local memory activists, concentrated local and state and even global commemorative resources, brought in political opportunities for memory projects, and began to shift the political culture of the state regarding the memory of civil rights era violence. So to answer my second question, whether the 2004 commemoration was in fact transformative is yes. I used, a, it's called a, a formal qualitative method. It's called event structure analysis. And it's, it's a computer assisted um, program. I'm happy to talk more about it later if people are interested. And in the book, there's a methodological appendix that explains the, the process I used but it, it allowed me to really trace the causal pathways connecting the 40th anniversary commemoration to these three racially rooted transformations. And while I don't have time to present and elaborate on each of these cases in depth, each receives its own chapter in the book, I do wanna highlight a few key points. For many small scale memory movements, a commemorative event 
marks the culmination of their work. Right? So this was the case in 1989 when local memory activists in Neshoba County conceptualized the 25th anniversary commemoration as their target outcome. And in this context, enacting the commemoration was a success in its own right, representing a fundamental change in how the past was publicly remembered. In 2004, on the other hand, the task force continued to work together after the commemoration, demonstrating a, an even deeper commitment to continued memory activism than in 1989. And this is evident in Leroy Clemens' recollection of the time immediately following the 40th anniversary event. Clemens was one of the co-chairs for the 2004 commemoration planning task force. And, and he said, everybody was really pleased with how it had gone, referring to the commemoration. We just really never expected it to go that smoothly. And the question we were grappling with was, what's next? And this leads me to my second major theoretical argument about commemorations. The commemorations both emerge from and catalyze associated memory movements. Commemorative vehicles like the 25th and 40th anniversary commemoration services have many of the characteristics of successful social movement mobilization. They must acquire sufficient resources, seize advantageous political opportunities, and frame their projects in a way that their target audiences find compelling. But commemorations I've come to find may also promote memory movements, helping solidify a continued commitment to memory activism and building the, com the commemorative capacity of those communities undertaking such projects to achieve broader structural change. But how, <laughs> you might be wondering, not all commemorative events spark subsequent memory activism and you would be absolutely right. And this is also what makes the 40th anniversary uh, in 2004 even more fascinating, right? And it leads me to my final question. Why did the 2004 commemoration spark subsequent memory activism when previous commemorations had, hadn't, right? When they had failed to do so. And this answer requires us to reconceptualize commemorations of racial violence as instances of intergroup contact. My third major argument about commemorations. You see, planning a large scale commemorative event is a complicated undertaking. Architects of commemoration must pivot between the sacred and the profane attending to potent cultural representations, uh, its symbols, songs, and artistic renderings, while also managing really mundane organizational details, such as securing sound equipment and setting up chairs. And this may help explain why organizers of commemorative events so often overlook the social psychological dimensions of the planning process an omission that is especially consequential when commemorating racial violence and other emotionally laden pasts. For many, I've, I've learned, and this is true in Philadelphia and in, and in many places um, that are commemorating racial violence, these commemorative projects, which are increasingly interracial projects, are for many people, for most, the first time they're discussing race or racial violence in interracial company. And as such, these interactions represent, again, what social psychologists refer to as intergroup contact. And it turns out that a substantial body of research, uh, which draws on the seminal work of Gordon Allport's The Nature of Prejudice, confirms that intergroup contact reduces intergroup prejudices, provided that certain conditions are met. And these conditions include, as you see here, equal status within the situation so that each group can fully participate in the relationship. Number two, cooperation towards a common goal or task that requires groups to work together. Three, support of relevant authorities that helps normalize interactions between groups. And four, possibilities for intimate informal contact or what social psychologist Thomas Pettigrew calls friendship potential. Albeit, so this is what I discovered. Um, and, and, and it was, uh, I didn't set out looking for this. It was really truly a discovery. What I what I what I learned is that, albeit unintentionally, the planners of the 40th anniversary event in Philadelphia, Mississippi, fulfilled all of these conditions, powerfully shaping possibilities for their commemorative work. In particular, adhering to these conditions uh, allowed for the 2004 planning task force to develop a collective identity as the Philadelphia Coalition and a deep commitment to continued memory activism. So let me explain. 
So the 25th anniversary commemoration in 1989 was initiated and almost entirely planned by local white men. Um, here we're gonna be talking about equal status within the situation. Um, with local, so the 25th anniversary, as I said before, um, initiated and almost entirely planned by local white men in prominent leadership positions. Most notably, Stanley Dearman, the former owner and editor of the Neshoba Democrat, uh, and also Dick Malpas, who was then Mississippi, Mississippi Secretary of State and a local Philadelphian. And while they recruited other local leaders to participate in the planning committee, including the president of, of Neshoba County's branch of the NAACP, African-American involvement in the project was largely tokenistic. The 2004 Commemoration Planning Committee, in contrast, prioritized racial inclusivity from the start, including the selection of the task force co-chairs. Again, Dick Malpas and Stanley Dearman initiated discussions about the upcoming anniversary, but they quickly passed the proverbial baton to a new generation of local leaders who represented Neshoba County's two largest racial groups. Both, both Leroy Clemens, who's African-American, and Jim Prince, who's white, had grown up in Philadelphia, attended its newly integrated public schools, and worked for Dearman at the local newspaper. So they were familiar with each other and had independently developed an interest in revisiting Philadelphia's past. In the spring of 2004, both men occupied notable leadership positions in the city, Clemens as the, the new president of the local branch of the NAACP, and Prince as the new editor of the local newspaper. And from the beginning of the planning process, both men conceptualized the commemoration as an interracial project that depended on diverse representation. This is evident in their first conversations about the project when they agreed, and this is in Clemens's words, to do a memorial service, but to make it a community-wide memorial service. Consequently, the co-chairs were intentional about the composition of the task force, reaching beyond their immediate social networks to ensure that various stakeholder groups were represented. Clemens recalls early conversations with Prince about the task force composition. He said, we talked about who we needed to have at the table to plan this thing. Mount Zion had been carrying on this service for 39 years by themselves. We needed them at the table first. Then we went about the city asking and recruiting people from different areas of the city, different parts, different positions in the city saying, we would like you to be a part of helping us plan this. So in some, the leadership and composition of the 2004 planning committee provided equal status to those from the community's major racial demographic groups. Moving on to number two, uh, cooperation on common goals. In 1989, the Commemoration Planning Committee's mandate had been fairly circumscribed to plan the 25th anniversary commemoration. Right? And its process flowed from the top down and its agenda, both implicit and explicit, did not embrace developing a shared common goal from the bottom up. A Philadelphia resident who participated in both commemoration services described the 1989 mandate as confined to only the commemorations planning. And he said, uh, we were planning an event, you know, it could have been a festival. So although the 1989 commemoration did have a shared goal, i.e. event planning, uh, it was not a goal that required interracial cooperation and collaboration in a meaningful sense. In contrast, the 2004 commemoration developed cooperation towards common goals inductively, right? So from the ground up, beginning with the first meeting, Jim Prince, right, the 2004 task force's other co-chair, jokingly described to me the first task force meeting in 2004 as kind of like an AA, right, Alcoholics Anonymous meeting with participants introducing themselves following the classic health self-help formula. Hi, my name is so-and-so and I'm here because, right? And as each participant uh, contributed their thoughts, one thing became very clear that regardless of race, all shared uh, an, a deep affection for their community. Right. For them, Neshoba County was not the cold, unfeeling place depicted in the film Mississippi Burning, and it was certainly not a place to be feared or avoided, feelings that were still held by many outside the county. And underlying this impulse for impression management was also a desire to seek justice for the three civil rights workers. And this was the shared goal that united members of the 2004 task force and one that emerged organically. And certainly not every meeting went smoothly. Um, members of the Philadelphia Coalition can, can speak in much more detail about this. Uh, but what I've learned from many of them is that when tempers flared, the group's common commitment kept them united. 
according to Deborah Posey, another task force me member, the group did not necessarily agree, and this is a quote, um, not necessarily agree on every step that is taken, but they put their differences down to come together for one purpose, their shared goal. Okay, number three, support of relevant authorities. So while the political environments in 1989 and 2004 were not entirely sympathetic to commemorating racial violence, neither project, subs neither project faced substantial repression. I mean, on the contrary, actually, in both 1989 and 2004, the city, county, and nearby Choctaw tribe made monetary contributions. And those dona donations had right, a symbolic dimension. They signified the support of authorities establishing, sociologically speaking, the norm of acceptance. It's also worth noting that the sitting governors attended both commemorations. So in 1989, that would have been Governor Ray Nabus, known of Mrs. one of Mississippi's quote, boys of spring intent on progressive change in the state. In fact, he canceled a trip to Paris to be able to attend the event. And he delivered a passionate speech drawing on civil rights symbolism. In 2004, Governor Haley Barber's presence caused more of a stir. A conservative Republican known for his illustrious lobbying career in Washington, DC, Barbara had become embroiled in racial controversies before the commemorative event. And this is what made the photograph of Haley Barber and Representative John Lewis especially significant. And we can see that photograph here. So again, this is from Jim Prince. Um, Jim Prince, one of the, the event's co-chairs summarized the significance of this photograph for me. He said, um, we knew uh, we being the, the Philadelphia, we knew that the Philadelphia coalition had opposition in the state down in Jackson against what we were trying to do. We knew that the attorney general, Jim Hood, had oppos opposition against him trying to reopen the case. And after that memorial service and the governor in that picture with John Lewis surfaced all over the place, that went away. At that point, Jim Hood was able to move on freely without getting those late night calls saying, what are you doing? So in, in short, the photograph created a powerful political moment, right? Signaling tacit support from the state's highest political authority. Four, and we're almost done, I promise. <laughs> um, four, uh, possibilities for informal intimate contact. All right, so while the 1989 task force had begun with the fundamental task of event planning, focusing on funding and other organizational concerns, the 2004 task force began with stories. When the 2004 task force moved its meeting from the Chamber of Commerce to the Fellowship Hall of the First United Methodist Church, the change in setting seemed to indicate a, a change in the emotional tenor of the meetings. Participants began to engage in ritual storytelling, revealing their personal connections to race and violence in Neshoba County. For instance, one black member of the group, she wept as she spoke of her family's fear in 1964, that Klansmen uh, would return to finish the job. Um, her family had been um, had been beaten at Mount Zion. Um, and then there was a, a white working class woman who had married into the family of one of the murderers. And she shared that she had long believed her husband's family, that the three civil rights workers were, quote, dirty communist infiltrators until she saw a picture of them. And after years of prayer, she hoped that faith would bring redemption to her community. Most significantly, this storytelling served as a form of consciousness raising, linking personal experiences to structural forces while also deepening and complicating participants' understandings of their own pasts and the racial experiences of others. And additionally, this growing emotional affinity began to actually transform the boundaries of in-groups and out-groups generating a new sense of common belonging when participants in the task force began to identify themselves by a new name, a new group, the Philadelphia Coalition. And we can see the power of this newfound collective identity in a quotation from another coalition member who vocalized what others reported feeling. That, and this is from Elsie Kirksey, she said, we were enjoying the coalition and sort of not forgetting why we were there, but it was just, she paused, we were, we were family. It's also important to note that the four conditions that I just discussed, the four conditions for positive intergroup contact appear to be self-reinforcing. By addressing issues of power within the task force, the equal status among participants and co-chairs enabled storytelling as a form of intimate contact, which in turn clarified the group's collective goals 
and cultivated their shared identity as the Philadelphia Coalition, an identity that helped establish their legitimacy for local and state political actors, which led to these legal, educational, and civil transformations I mentioned earlier. So it all, it all worked together. So in sum, we've discussed three major questions. Right? When and how have the murders been commemorated locally? Whether the 2004 commemoration was in fact transformative? And if so, why did the 2004 commemoration spark subsequent memory activism when previous commemorations had failed to do so? And in answering these questions, I make both historical and sociological arguments, right? So historically, describing Neshoba Countians as silent on the murders obscures the active commemorative work of local black citizens and their allies. Sociologically, I suggest that commemorating racial violence can powerfully transform communities under certain circumstances. And more generally, I suggest several insights about commemorations. So first, that they are path dependent, right? Which is to say that earlier commemorations create conditions of possibility for later commemorations. They build on one another, right? Number two, that we can think of commemorations as both the causes and consequences of associated memory movements, however small, micro or local those memory movements are. And finally, that it is critical for us to reconceptualize interracial efforts towards commemorating racial violence as instances of intergroup contact. So to return to the debate, the philosophical debate that I talked about at the beginning of this presentation to remember or forget. I don't think this should be an either or question, right? I think the question is under what conditions are commemorations able to transform local memory practices? And as communities continue to commemorate racial violence and other difficult pasts, I really do believe they can draw insight from the experiences that occurred in Philadelphia, in particular, that the process of planning a commemoration is critical to its outcomes. And that by managing intergroup relations effectively, communities can strengthen a commemoration's transformative potential. Or put differently, how a commemoration is put together matters for its outcomes. Right? Recognizing that the planning process itself is a racialized process is crucial for communities to consider when commemorating racial violence. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. That was great. We have questions and comments from the live stream. We pass along a few of those. Susie Altman notes that she covered, she photographed the Freedom Summer Trials for over six weeks and photographed the 40th anniversary um, commemoration and much more that she wishes she had had a chance to meet you then. And oh, I would love that. Shelley Baxter notes that she is doing research on this area now connected to the Dawes Commission in 1901. Um, and gives contact information if you want to talk with her about that. Yeah. Great, um, thank you. And then an interesting observation from, um, let me get back to it here, Drew Brixen, who says, conditions for positive intergroup interaction strikingly similar to basic training environment in the armed forces. Hmm. <laughs> That's interesting. It's, I'd love to learn more. Yeah. Well, but I think what's, Oh, sorry, just to riff on yeah. this for a second. Um, I would imagine, I don't have military experience, but I would imagine that what is critical is creating a sense of community, right? A collective identity, transforming people that are essentially separate individuals, right? With their own social experiences and backgrounds, creating an experience that unites them as, as, as something, as, as, as one together, right. a new, a new group, a new community. Um, so in some ways that's not surprising that, that the conditions would be similar. Yeah. 
Uh, speaking of group, are, are any of the groups, the Philadelphia Coalition and other groups, uh, still together in any real way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a really interesting question. Um, I haven't been back in a couple of years, but I did go back for the 50th anniversary commemoration. Um, and there were, were some, some efforts of a smaller group of those individuals to connect. I know that individuals who are a part of the Philadelphia Coalition have very, very much continued to do this work. And also many of them have returned to their very busy lives, right? And I think that's one thing that I really learned from this research is that Commemorative work is work. Yeah. And I think a lot of people don't realize or, or for, forget um, how much labor, how much time, how much energy, how much money goes into the, this programming. And in many ways, that's why there, there are a lot of similarities between commemorative efforts and social movement mobilizations. Right? It really takes resources, opportunity, active, engaged people. And one thing that we see, and just to reveal a little bit more of, of, of my background, one of my subfields within sociology is the study of social movements. And increasingly, we're seeing more synergy between collective memory research and, and social movement research. And um, one thing that we see in the social movement side of things is, is just like attrition, right? because social movement activism does take a lot of energy, right? And a lot of time, what we refer to in sociology is biographical availability, which is one of the reasons why so many people that are engaged in social movement are young, because they don't have children. They don't necessarily have the same work commitments, right? right? You have to have some biographical availability. And so in many ways, what the folks in Philadelphia did is remarkable. There were some young folks, but a lot of people were very established in their careers and they made a significant commitment of time and energy um, and then and, and resources to to this project, but that's only sustainable for so long. Yeah, yeah. Susan Cushman writes, although no one died during the student protest in February of 1970 on the Ole Miss campus, over 60 students were arrested, and one black student who had done all her work for graduation was denied her diploma. She finally received it in February of 2020 during a 50th anniversary commemoration of the event. This and other civil rights events are highlighted in my new book, John and Mary Margaret, set in Mississippi and Memphis from the 1950s to present time. I hope that my small effort will contribute to, quote, sustained memory activism. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing. And then Mark Carlson writes, I am here because I read Three Lives from Mississippi and Mississippi Black Paper as a student at Washington High School in Fremont, California in the 1960s. My son, a student at Sacramento High School in 2004, attended the 2004 commemoration, my first of now a fair number of pilgrimages. Uh, he notes parenthetically, I remember Haley Barber and tepid applause contrasting with thunderous ovations for other speakers. Then he says, I stopped by Mount Nebo and had lunch down the block in March 2020. Is the video of the service out at Mount Zion in 2004 available? It yeah. was um, transmitted to the Neshoba County Coliseum via the Ole Miss satellite truck. It was a richly powerful service. And this is so helpful for our process of renaming our church social hall in Sacramento. Thank you for that. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if there, there was a question about if the video is available. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of one, but I do know that uh, the service was live streamed out to the Coliseum. Um, if anyone does ever come across a video of it, I would love to see it. I've, I haven't actually seen video recording of that event. Mm. Um, so that would be that would be a wonderful treat. Um, and I really appreciate the the comment coming from Sacramento. Um, if you if you end up if anyone ends up getting a copy of my book and reads the preface, um, they'll learn that I'm I'm from California, and I get asked that a lot, um, or I get asked if I'm from Mississippi actually, <laughs> um, and I'm not, but uh, but I just I find that these really are universal issues, and that there's so much to learn from Mississippi about how these issues commemorating racial violence has been handled. Again, these, these perils and possibilities. And, and I do think that a lot of the lessons learned, the sociological insights from this case can be applied really anywhere. Yeah. Uh, anywhere. So thank you for that. We had talked a little bit about 
Dave Tell and his work with the Emmett Till Memory Project. Do you have any thoughts on the commemorations in Philadelphia and the commemorations in the Delta around the Emmett Till murder and the trial? Yeah, a, a little bit. I, I, I'm, I'm remiss that I haven't, as I mentioned, I haven't followed up with Dave Tell. I think that it, we really need to, in some ways, connect our research because yeah. we were simultaneously working on very similar things on opposite sides of the state. Right. right? If, if I'm correct, um, but, and I think about the, the, time, the time order of these events, I believe that what happened in Philadelphia happened first, was a precursor. And I would suggest that in many ways what happened in Philadelphia created, again, conditions of possibility, political opportunities for what then happened in the Delta. And I think one way that this happened is through helping to like, le legitimize these processes, right? And we saw, we saw that in, in, in Barber's presence, right, at the event, but also in buttressing what was a very, at the time, a very nascent um, state level structural support for these projects, right? So at the time, the William Winter Institute for Racial Reconciliation was still very new. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, what happened in Philadelphia made the Winter Institute as much as the Winter Institute helped what happened and made what happened in Philadelphia. So that was a very like, you know, synergistic process. And then on top of that, um, it's hard, it's hard not to talk about civil rights history today without talking about tourism. Yes. And at the time, Mississippi really didn't have, or was just beginning to focus a, a concerted tourism effort on black history and civil rights history. There had been a, you know, a little bit of stuff on blues, right? But there really wasn't a focus in Jackson uh, at the state institutions um, on civil rights history and tourism. And as, a, as, a, as, a, as an effect of what was happening in Philadelphia, I think there was, again, more, more energy, more legitimacy around those efforts mm -hmm. that in turn could get fueled into communities um, and on the other side of the state, and where we see what was hap what's happening with with Dave Tell's work and and the Emmett Till memorials. Um, I wonder if you might say a few words about <clears throat> the work that Florence Mars did in Philadelphia and how that helped you oh, at all. Wow. Yeah, great question. Um, I have read her book Witness in Philadelphia so many times. Yeah, <laughs> it's a it's a it's just a beautiful book and yeah. it's a courageous book. Um, so often, you know, in my presentation, I talked about, you know, Black Neshoba Countians and their allies. Florence Mars was one of those most prominent allies, right? Um, a young white woman who was really in many ways on the front lines of this work and, and suffered consequences for it. Um, so her book um, is a, a, a really powerful representation of that counter memory I mm -hmm. talked about. Right. So that it was there. And in some and you know, and that book came out, I want to say just before Mississippi. Uh, mm, no, when was it? Ooh, if anyone has that, feel free to put it in the, in the chat. I'm trying to remember the, the publication date. Um, it was either I want to say it was in I, I'm, I'm trying to remember how it corresponds with the Mississippi Burning movie. But there was another movie before that. So forgive me I'm trying to to chase down these, these dates in my head. Um, but it's, it's another example of this counter memory that existed, but in many journalistic and even scholarly uh, conversations about Neshoba County might be mentioned in passing, but it wasn't integrated into, into the broader understanding of what, what had happened. Yeah. Um, and so I really think we need to recognize that Neshoba Countyans were never silent this long silence it doesn't entirely make sense. It only makes sense if we're thinking about a particular uh, section of, of Philadelphians and Neshoba Countyans. Let me read Nikki Matson's comment, which is, I think, appropriate to what you just said. She writes, a common theme that I keep noticing across many disciplines and what I think is one of the most important aspects of any field or project working toward reconciliation and healing is listening. 
Knowledge of other people's experiences is invaluable and monumentally important. Thank you for your work. So. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and if I can just take this opportunity to just to <laughs> reference something that Chris mentioned about my, um, my biography. So I, at Furman University, Furman University, a liberal arts um, university in, in Greenville, South Carolina, I created and co-founded this intergroup dialogue program um, for our students. And um, I think some people thought that I was doing that work and then started writing about it in the context of, of Philadelphia and in the context of Mississippi, but it's exactly the opposite. By being in Mississippi, seeing this, how this work and how dialogic, uh, dialogue-based storytelling processes really transformed possibilities for broader social change made me realize that that could be applied in other contexts, um, which then led to this programming um, at, at, at my university. I, I wonder, in the time that you have been working on the project that led to this book and the field in general, um, if you have seen any change in the way reconciliation is viewed as an objective, a goal, what it means, uh, what it means to different groups. No, you're reminding me of my first trip to Mississippi. <laughs> I, um, I used the term reconciliation. I, I was there studying, you know, this, this truth and reconciliation commission, um, the Mississippi truth project. And, and I was in Philadelphia. I was at the Longdale community center, which is essentially a cinder block ruins. Um, mm. And there was a group of people meeting for a commemoration. And I said I was studying reconciliation in the state and, and was very quickly um, almost admonished by this particular individual um, and saying that for them, they didn't feel like there was anything to reconcile, right? They were more focused on the pursuit of justice in particular legal justice. So this was not so long after the, the Edgar Ray Killen trial and there were still concerted efforts in the state um, to pursue additional uh, cases um, in, with this, with the Neshoba County case, right? Um, so what that told me very quickly as a sociologist is that people are applying very different cognitive frameworks to this term reconciliation, right? And, and, and going forward, I had to think very creatively about how, how do I study and talk about something that is inherently um, a, a, bringing such different meanings <laughs> for different people. Um, but one thing I would say, um, and I imagine we're about to wrap up here soon in just a second, is that in, in the over 10 years that I've been working on this particular project, um, there has been a dramatic transformation in the general social acceptance for these projects. Um, when I started this work, um, doing these projects felt risky. Yeah. Um, and in some ways, it still carries risks, no doubt. Um, but in a lot of institutional settings, and I would say this is true in higher education, in, in many contexts, it has become risky not to pursue these projects. Um, and so in many ways, the, 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 the calculus is beginning to, to shift. Um, and I'll be really interesting to see how that develops, because I, I'm not convinced that it's necessarily a linear process. Yeah. Um, so we'll see. We're coming up on the top of the hour, but we have a few minutes left and several comments and questions. So if you're game, we'll keep going. Sure. Go All right. It. Deirdre Payne writes, this past Monday, Mississippi as a state observed Confederate History Month. The sons of Confederate veterans are adamant in their honoring of their heritage. Can there ever be reconciliation with that being sanctioned by the state government? How can the two sides coexist and build a better Mississippi? Oh, that is a, that's a tough one. And an important <laughs> Just answer that for us. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 an, and such an important question. Um, yeah, it's such an important question. How can they coexist? I mean, you know, I, I sometimes do get questions about um, efforts to decommemorate, mm -hmm. right? So in my field, that's something that people are beginning to study, especially you know, uh, post Charlottesville. Um, and, and my answer tends to be, I tend to focus on a more local level, 
right? I think that what's really critical is the process of at a, at a local community level, starting, starting there. It's not that it can't build, and I think, I think it should and can, um, but I think having more micro conversations about these initiatives can be a, a good starting point. Um, so I don't know that I have a, a good answer for this particular question, um, <laughs> certainly in the time that we have left, but it is such an important question to recognize that there are, how do we say, so sorry, I'm, I'm sort of drifting into my head here. Um, I was talking to my students yesterday about collective memory broadly, and, and we were talking about just some, some general truths about collective memory. And one is that, um, that it's partial, right? Collect, we, whether, it's, whether you're telling the history of your own biography or the history of your family or the history of your right. state, you have to be selective. You can't possibly tell everything. And of course, how we make those decisions and what we choose to elevate or demote reveals a lot about who we are and what we value as individuals and as collectives. And so I would say that while I don't have a good answer for this particular question, that I do think it's critical that we keep having those conversations and that we recognize that collective memory and its physical representations uh, in, ter in terms of rituals, in terms of symbols and even flags, um, which I know has been a hot topic in, in Mississippi for a long time, um, those have always been in flux, right? Those have always been changing and they will continue to, and that it is critical to continue to have these conversations about how these cultural symbols represent who we are and what we believe, whatever that means for where you are. Mm -hmm. Claire, are there commemorations going on in other states or that you're aware of, that you keep up with, that you? Yes and yes. Um, so many, I can't keep up with them all. Um, <laughs> One particularly interesting initiative that some of the um, viewers might be familiar with is the Equal Justice Initiative. The Equal yeah. Justice Initiative is EJI's um, community remembrance projects. So a couple of years ago, Equal Justice Initiative, you know, most known for their legal work um, representing uh, folks who are falsely accused or on death row, um, have actually got into the work of, of memory and collective memory and, and trying to uh, re- um, Re reconceive, rearticulate, re-narrativize um, the history of race and racial terror in the United States. And part of their effort has been to encourage local communities to host their own community remembrance projects. And once you do and you follow through a series of steps prescribed by EJI, that county can actually claim this uh, a memorial, right? Um, so it, 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 we don't have time to, to go into, in, yeah. into all this detail, um, but if folks are interested, definitely look up EJI's um, Community Remembrance Projects. This is all to say th the work of a nonprofit organization based out of Montgomery, Alabama, has actually mobilized micro memory movements hmm. all over the state and all over the country. And so what I'm finding in this book and arguing this book, I think, is as critical as it's ever been because we're starting to see a proliferation of these types of projects. And I'm in fact involved in ours in Greenville, oh. South Carolina. Um, and I, I see over and over again, a focus on the outcome, i.e. erecting a monument, erecting a memorial, and not a lot of focus or recognition of the process itself and the way that we bring our racialized experiences and frameworks into right. the planning process. And if that's that's my one big takeaway: is slow down, recognize that this is, that the process itself is racialized, and the process itself is the work. Mm -hmm. So, I'll I'll stop there. No, that's great. Uh, we have come to the top of another hour. Thank you all for watching with us today. Remember to join in next week, either virtually or in person, when Jennifer Bond will talk with us about her new book. This book is Between Remembrance and Repair, Commemorating Racial Violence in Philadelphia, Mississippi. Thank you, Claire Whitlinger. We'll look forward to more with you in the future. Thank you.